Testing one, two. Testing. So you say. I just, before I actually start, I want to say that usually I'm the one that spills the water and juice and other liquids. So I'm very grateful that I, I'm it, here for it wasn't me. Yes. I'm here for you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's so nice to see all of you here, and welcome to the wonderful School of Communication at American University. My name is Marnell Niles Goins. I'm the Dean of SOC, and I started this role July 1st. So this is actually, I know, it's so sweet. <laughs> I heard a collective, oh, which was very, very nice and unexpected. It's also my first time seeing the green room. And uh, I'm really, really delighted to um, not only uh, be up here and looking at your beautiful faces, but also to give a proper welcome. I started this role, as I mentioned, um, just a couple months ago, and I have been so impressed with the faculty, the staff, and the students of the school. I hope you're enjoying the warm, literally and figuratively, atmosphere of SOC, and that you have taken a little bit of time to slow down and take deep breaths outside as you walk across the campus through our arboretum, please know that AU's School of Communication is so grateful for this partnership. And on behalf of President Alger, who also started on July 1st, but was unable to be here tonight, the wonderful faculty and staff of the School of Communication, we are so honored to have PBS here. We are so honored to be able to host this event, and we are delighted that you have chosen our beautiful school to host this event. Your presence here brings even more energy. For those of you who don't know, the first day of class was on Monday. So this week has been so wonderful. Your presence has even has brought even more energy to this school. Thank you for being here tonight. I look forward to an enriching evening. I'd like to now introduce Julie Drizen, the Executive Director of Current. Julie. Thank you. that you are our new dean. Um, and I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. It is the first week of school, so students are a little bit flipped out and trying to find their classes and their professors, and some of them have never even been in this building before. Mm -hmm. And for those who are not here, thank goodness we are taping this so that it can be shared with students, faculty, staff, and alumni, and readers to current. So, Hello everybody, my name is Julie Drizen. I'm the Executive Director at Current, which is the number one source of news and information for people who work in public broadcasting. And uh, you can find us on current.org, and if you are on campus, you have free access outside the paywall. Current has been a center of AU School of Communication since 2010, 2011, and I've been there for about a decade. But I've had a 40-year career in public media and the gray hair to show it. Um, I'm excited to be participating and for Kurt to be part of tonight's event. And I'm grateful to PBS and SOC for including us. Now, I first met Judy Woodruff. She probably doesn't remember this, but she's one of my public media heroes. I met her about 15 years ago when, for an extremely brief period of time, I launched and produced a daily multicultural news and talk show at WETA radio called The Intersection. Um, PBS NewsHour is based at WETA. So thank you, Judy, also for being a supporter of Current. I first met Steve Inskeep, who probably isn't remember this either, but about 10 years ago, when he graciously agreed to host the Casey Medals for Meritorious Journalism on Children and Families. That's when I directed that a center on journalism on children and families at the Philip Merrill College of Journalism at UND. Not only did Steve host this award ceremony brilliantly, but it was the very first event that took place in NPR's then new headquarters in the Noma neighborhood. Um, so Steve is also one of my public media heroes and I thank you for being a leader of current. I want to tell you a little bit more about Ricardo Sandoval Palos, the public editor at PBS. Now, he's had a long and impressive career, which you can check out on his LinkedIn profile or on the PBS page when you, when you search for him. But I want to say more about what a public editor does. 
It's a role that used to be called ombudsman and then it morphed into ombudsperson and now it's often called public editor. So RIP is the public editor at PBS. NPR also has a public editor named Kelly McBride, who is a longtime professor of journalism and ethics at the Pointer Institute for Journalism, uh, the leading training organization for professional and would-be professional journalists in the US. So what do RIP and Ke Kelly do? I don't envy their jobs. <laughs> PBS and NPR routinely receive a ton of email from readers, listeners, and viewers complaining mostly about the content that they are listening to, reading, or viewing on public media platforms. And those complaints, by the way, come from people on both sides of the political divide. On the left, on the very far left actually, not so much on the liberal side, people, um, lefties accuse NPR and PBS of not being progressive or liberal enough. On the right, PBS and NPR are often accused of being way too liberal and not being balanced or fair or objective. These are terms that we debate in public media all the time. So what's ironic about this bipolar criticism is that public media's mission is actually to feature voices and stories from people from all walks of life. That's what these two professional journalists have done for their entire careers, with respect. And those stories are shared on TV, radio, now podcasts and digital platforms. So the difference between the right and the left critique is that on the right, it's usually coupled with a fierce campaign to eliminate public broadcasting funding which is about $500 million a year. And that is smaller per capita investment in information and civil discourse in this country that happens on public media. Smaller investment per person than almost, well, actually I think it's than any public media system in any country around the world. So the investment is really, really small and the donations and foundations and um, sponsors actually turn this into three and a half billion dollar industry. So that investment is increased nine times. So the fight for funding is frequent, persistent, predictable, and the reason why public media wins this fierce battle every two years is because of Judy and Steve and the exceptional quality of service that they provide to America. Every year, public media leaders and readers and listeners and viewers and board members gather in DC, go up to Capitol Hill and meet their Congress people and make the case for funding and something really kind of funny happens. The Republicans who are supposed to be against public media actually secretly favor it. They want to support it, but they can't be out of the closet about that because that is politically incorrect. I've heard this story over and over again. Members of Congress love Big Bird, PBS Kids, British dramas, Masterpiece Theater, and PBS NewsHour. For years, surveys have shown that PBS is one of the most trusted institutions in America. Thank you, Judy and Rick. Now, when it comes to NPR, it's a little different story. Those members of Congress really don't like NPR, but they do want to be interviewed on NPR and they do like their local NPR stations because those stations treat them with respect, quote them and, and interview them all the time and give them access to their constituents and other people in the local audience that they need to reach. So back to Rick's job as a public editor. This is a role that almost all legacy print media have had over the years. And we know that newspapers are shrinking and disappearing. And actually, this role is also going away. Many newspapers have stopped with the public editor. And I think some of that has to do with, um, with social media. 
but public radio and TV has not nixed this role. And that's because PBS, NPR, public media stations belong to the American people, must reflect the American people, serve the American people, be responsive and accountable to the American people. And I know the journalists on this stage take that very seriously to heart. So I want to thank and applaud Steve and Judy for their important work, not just in this election year, but in their entire careers, which have been about trying to bridge divides and inform the American public. By doing so, they are protecting free speech, they are inspiring future generations, and they are helping public media thrive. So as everyone on this stage knows, the mission of public broadcasting uh, from 1967 with the Public Broadcasting Act has also been to serve underserved and diverse audiences. And that includes BIPOC, rural, and younger audiences. Besides PBS Kids, public media has not been doing a great job with that, either within our institutions or in our audiences. And uh, we've been grappling with, with that for my entire 40-year career, um, and more so, of course, since the murder of George Floyd in 2020. Current is doing our part to advance the cause of diversity, equity, and inclusion in public media, our, our field. Most recently, let me hawk this, it's a free product. It's, ooh, who remembers print? Um, Current is still in print four times a year, but this is our Rising Stars edition. And this profiles this year professionals under the age of 35 who are moving, shaking, rocking public media. And these are people who are younger, not under 35 for those of you who are much younger than 35, must sound like really, really old. Uh, but you'll get there soon enough. And it's not actually that old for public media. 20,000 people work in our field, and a lot of them look like me. And the audiences to public media are around 60 and 70, sadly, at least on broadcast. So these are things that these people are trying to change. So I want you to pick up a paper. I want you to read about these rising stars. I want you to be inspired. I want you to read Current at Current.org. I want to thank Dan Macy of PBS, Rick. I want to thank Kati Vera, our amazing events coordinator, Jacob and Mads, who are in the tech space, Current's editor, Karen Everhart, and our newest reporter, Austin Fuller, for being here. They're going to be doing the mic running um, when it's time for your questions and participation. And thanks, Steve and Judy, for sharing your very limited time, your deep wisdom with all of us here today. And I hope that SFC and Current can work with PBS and NPR to revisit a lot of what we're talking with today after the inauguration. Thank you. Thank you. That's what I call three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Did you work for Metro? <laughs> the Metro Man. Uh, hey, listen, thanks everybody for being here. Uh, just a quick, by way of quick introduction. I had the honor of working with Steve for a few years at NPR. Amazingly, he's still willing to share a stage. <laughs> This is my thought? Uh, it, oh, it was a supervising editor at the Morning Edition, and uh, it was an honor working with somebody who handles journalism the way Steve does. Not just in broadcast, but he's an amazing writer as well. And um, you notice that he's got one of his books out here, which is part of the reason why we're here. The title of the book is, take it away, Differ We Must. How Lincoln Succeeded in Divided America, okay. which is on point to what we're going to be talking about tonight. And really, thank you for being here on this uh, wonderful weather evening. It's the kind of weather that this California boy would tell you that it's great to be indoors with some air conditioning, maybe a drink in hand later, talking politics. All right. Also, I want to introduce Judy, Judy Woodruff. Special correspondent for PBS News, longtime anchor at the, the News Hour. Now, what, PB, what PBS is graced with 
is Judy going out across the country to look at this very question with the segment that's called America at a Crossroads. Great. All right. Um, you, you know, it's fantastic uh, that we have two great minds to talk about this tonight. Um, and this actually stems, what we're doing here stems a lot from the kind of emails that I've been getting uh, in this particular election year. So every day, uh, Dan and I field probably a couple of dozen emails that run the gamut of we hate you, to mm -hmm. we love you, um, and but they all have, <laughs> then they have one thing in common. They all say, most of them are saying, I wish we could get along. But then they add the caveat. They, we should get along based on my belief or my version of what is right and what is wrong. Which I think tells us why we're so, how we're so divided, right? And I got to thinking, okay, let's talk about this to a greater extent and see if we can come up with maybe some answers that will take us to how we can get over this, how we can bridge this chasm and get to the point where we can at least talk to each other again. And seventh grade, as an immigrant from Mexico, and had the great pleasure of being asked to be part of the debate team in junior high. And the way we started the debate, uh, every debate, was we had a set of commonly accepted facts upon which we would build arguments on one side or the other. And we would venture into discussions about that. And it's changed. In the many years I've been doing this, I now see that we can't even agree on a common set of facts. So we can't even get started on a discussion because we can't even degree, agree on what the facts are in a given discussion. I don't agree with that. <laughs> no, Joe, <laughs> Joe. <laughs> I think this is how we work together for a few weeks. <laughs> but it's, so this is what I want to explore tonight and see if there's possibility, if there's hope for us, right? So the jump ball question for the two of you, you can uh, choose to see who starts off, is are we really that divided? Or are we just noticing it more because of technology and because of the, the, uh, the diversity of media that we now have? And we're all brands, right, online. Um, so I wanted, I'm wondering if, if we are truly divided or if we just notice it more. I mean, after all, there was a civil war that was pretty divisive. You know, there's been other episodes in our history where we've been truly, truly deeply divided. So I'm kind of curious as to where we stack now. I'll defer to Judy. Go for it. Well, unlike Steve, I didn't cover uh, Lincoln uh, when he was in the <laughs> I couldn't resist, it's sorry. Okay. It was hard to get the interview, but finally. <laughs> I, do, I do sometimes say, you know, I've been here since the Garfield administration. So. That's a little well, later, so. <laughs> there's no question the country's been divided before. There was a civil war. We've had huge debates over the war in Vietnam, over civil rights over integrating Americans, in, uh, new, new Americans into uh, Americans who were already here, going back to the beginning of our country. But to me, in this modern area, long enough, I've been covering politics. I started reporting in 1970, so I've been doing this for adult 54 years, 53 years. Um, I've never seen the country as divided as it is now. And we can talk about why and how that manifests itself. But to me, the thing that that's made it different. Yes, we've disagreed over lots and lots of issues, the role of government, um, how much money should we be spending, um, uh, abortion, you know, you could tick off the issues. To me, what's different today is the dark, um, demeaning sometimes views that each side has of people on the other side. And when you talk to psychologists, political scientists, and other people who've studied this and researched it, they, they talked to the woman um, in particular, Liliana Mason, who's done uh, written a number of books, of, several books about this. She talks about how the point came within the last decade or two, even to some extent even longer, when politics, we, we started identifying more and more by what party we belong to and whether we're an R or a D. And to the extent we now wear that cape, that Republican or Democratic cape, either left or right, or whether you want to call it conservative, liberal, progressive, whatever. We now assume that people in the other party 
um, believe that whole set of views that we think they have. And we think they're not just wrong, but we think they're bad people. And I'll just cite one poll, Ricardo, uh, the Pew Research Center in 2016 asked Americans, asked Republicans and Democrats, what do you think about people in the other party? Do you think they're, and they had a whole list of adjectives. One of those adjectives was immoral. In 2016, 47% of Republicans said they thought Democrats, most Democrats, were immoral. And it was, a, it was not that high, but it was 30 some percent among Democrats saying so. Republicans. 2023, seven years later, think about all that's happened in our country since then. The same question was put to Republicans. 72% of Republicans now say, and I think the number's probably even higher now, that they think Democrats are immoral. And I could give you other examples, other words that were used in the poll, but it tells you a lot about how we think folks on the other side are just not good people. And that makes it harder. When you think the other, the other side is bad, they're not just wrong, they're bad people. I don't want anything to do with them. And I think it makes it that much harder for us to find common ground. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, the incentives all go toward that. Uh, and this is nothing that people don't know. Social media encourages division, highlights division. Uh, it's part of the business model. And if you think for a moment, if you think about going on uh, Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it, if you think about going on any number of platforms, it is this giant machine that scours the wor world for the very dumbest thing that the person on the other side from you said today and makes sure that you see the very dumbest thing that the person on the other side said today. And then you get to respond to it instantly and in anger. And of all the responses to that dumb thing, whatever seems to the other side to be the very dumbest thing to them will be transmitted to them. And then that becomes the definition of the entire other side. This is the technique or one of the techniques by which we're all teaching each other that the people on the other side are evil. Um, the people on the other side, whatever your lights are, are definitely wrong, by the way. Um, and whatever your point of view is, you can find someone who really is wrong on the other side. Um, but I think we have lost sight of the fact that part of being in a democracy is living with people who are mistaken, living with people who have a different point of view than you have. Those letters that you get, emails, I bet sometimes they're like literal, like typewritten letters, but they're a little frightened to open the envelope. The way the handwriting is, I get them too. So anyway, those letters that you receive that effectively say, can't we all get along, um, are missing the point because we're not gonna and we're not supposed to. It is a democracy, it is a free society. We have all kinds of different traditions and backgrounds that we bring to the table and we're not gonna agree on everything. We're not even gonna agree on most things. And the narrower function of a democracy is not to get everybody to agree, but to get everybody on the same page for a few basic things to mediate our differences through this constitutional system that we have that is designed to manage disagreement. We had somebody on the radio today, Yuval Levine, uh, who's a conservative scholar who has written a book about the Constitution, and he was trying to get across a few basic points about the Constitution, and one of them is that it is a mechanism for managing clashing interests in America. And the whole idea of the system is you win an election, you think, yay, I won, my side's gonna prevail. And then you find out that even if you are president of the United States, you only have a little power. And there are all these other people in Congress and the Supreme Court, and even just random ordinary citizens who have rights and have power that you have to respect and listen to, and you've gotta deal with them somehow through this constitutional system. And it seems to me that a lot of people do not realize that that we are supposed to be divided, and then we are supposed to deal with it in some fashion. Judy astutely put it, her finger on one thing that makes that super hard, is each of us teaching each other that the other side is 100% bad. Mm -hmm. The truth is, even if the person on the other side is a horrible person, a horrible, horrible person, they still have power, and it's a good thing that they do because that means it's a democracy and they have the vote. Mm. And because they have the vote, even a bad person you have to deal with in some way. 
Maybe the way that you deal with them is by outvoting them in November, but maybe the way you deal with them is by finding one thing out of 100 you agree on. And I think you put it eloquently in the book um, where you describe that democracy demanded that Lincoln, for example, he had to reckon with people of different backgrounds. If he was going to succeed, he knew that he had to reach out to these folks. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, one of my favorite things to learn uh, in the book. Uh, I don't mean to shock you, my book about Lincoln was not the first book ever written about Lincoln. <laughs> uh, I thought there were 15,000 books about Lincoln and then I met the president of the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and said, no, it's up to 18,000 now. Um, and one of the truly great ones is Doris Kearns Goodwin's Team of Rivals, which became the basis for the movie Lincoln and a lot of other things. And it talks about the way that uh, Lincoln dealt with some people in his cabinet who had clashing ambitions with Lincoln. They all thought they should be president. Um, but even within that cabinet, at least they sort of had the same basic idea. They were anti-slavery in somewhat similar ways, and they were part of the same political party, and so they had a basis. Um, in my study, what I attempted to do was go a little bit broader. And how was it that Lincoln dealt with actual slave owners? How was it that Lincoln dealt with black people who felt that he was not nearly anti-slavery enough? How was it that he dealt with radical abolitionists who didn't really even accept the Constitution? They felt it was corrupted by slavery. How was it that he dealt with corrupt politicians when he wasn't a corrupt person himself? Um, and Lincoln had to open himself to these people. He had to have conversations with these people. He would try to make a deal with them. When that didn't work, he would try to manipulate them. He would try to get something out of them. And even when that failed, he would at least learn something from the conversation. And I think that Lincoln also had an awareness of something that we've also forgotten, or that we're told to forget constantly. And that is that he wasn't ever going to win forever. And the other side was never going to win forever. Democracy is never over, it's a process. And Judy, I'm wondering if uh, in all of this, if there's a parallel that we can that we can tie from that time to to, to today, today. And um, and I think the thing that uh, you said in one of the early episodes, and I think it's actually the first episode, you said that it's a far different time in the U.S. today than when you started out as a journalist. In the Garfield. The Garfield. <laughs> <laughs> I was in the Kimmel. <laughs> You got me back. You got me back. Okay. Um, it was me there. I came to Washington to cover the Carter administration, 1977, when, yes, Democrats and Republicans had different views. They argued over everything from the Panama Canal Treaty to, uh, you name it, to water projects that Jimmy Carter wanted to close down. Republicans were furious about this. He wanted to, believe it or not, he, a Democrat, wanted to streamline government. He wanted to go to something called the, what is it, um, zero-based budgeting. He had all kinds of interesting ideas. Republicans didn't like a lot of them. But somehow, both sides were still talking to each other. This was an era, and then you move past Carter to Reagan, who would occasionally have House Speaker Democrat Tip O'Neill over at the White House for a drink, six o'clock, a cocktail. George H.W. Bush, who followed Reagan, some of his best friends were Democrats. He had served in Congress before. He'd been an ambassador, head of the CIA. He knew a lot of Democrats. They were friends of his. He could talk to them. He'd have them over to the vice president's office, or he'd go to the Hill to talk to them. Um, and certainly the same thing with, with Bill Clinton. I mean, Clinton, yes, was a Democrat. Republicans did everything they could to try to foil what he was doing. And I would argue, frankly, that there were the seeds during the Clinton administration, during the the, the time when Newt Gingrich was speaker, you had the contract with America. To me, that was, those were some of the seeds that were sown that have led to where we are in our, in our divisions today. So there was division, there was disagreement, and Steve said it's part of a democracy. We're supposed to agree, we do agree, we're never gonna all agree on everything. The difference was that people still tolerated each other. Um, we, my husband and I would go out to dinner after we were married in 1980, and we'd always, you know, you'd always see Democrats and Republicans together. It was just the way it was. But fast forward to the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, that's happened less and less to the point today. It's considered, uh, you just, it, it's just not done. You don't see Republicans socialize with Republicans, Democrats socialize with Democrats. 
members of Congress don't bring their families to Washington anymore, so they don't know each other. They, they don't hang out in the gym. I'm told it used to be in the, in the House and Senate gyms. They would shoot baskets together. That doesn't happen. There are all kinds of things and ways that members of Congress would interact with one another that doesn't happen. They go back to their districts on Thursday nights. They show up in Washington on Monday night or Tuesday morning, and I'm not necessarily denigrating their schedule. I know they say they've got things to do back in the district or back in the state, but there's just less interaction. The party caucuses are much more powerful, and the caucuses determine um, what you're how you're supposed to vote. You are punished mm -hmm. if you are for any piece of legislation that the other side is proposing, not, and I mean, you not only uh, may not get that subcommittee assignment or chairmanship that you want, you, the party may not support you when you run for re-election. It's a, you know, names are taken, and, and, and the party remembers what you've done. It's just a, it's a much more partisan atmosphere yeah. than it used to be. And that's pretty frightening. Uh, one of the reasons why I think it's, it's a little bit um, disturbing, perhaps, that we're living in this environment now is because there is a power law that I found in your book that talks about Lincoln's time being a time of technological advancement, yeah. change. There was daily communication now available. I loved discovering this uh, in the book. Uh, as Judy and I covered it at the time, so um, it was fun then too, but it was great researching it in the book. Um, I've written three books about the 19th century, which take us from about the 1820s to the 1860s, and this was a time of tremendous technological change. At the beginning of the 1800s, a trip from New York to St. Louis would take like six weeks, and you'd risk your life. Um, and then after a while, there were better roads, and then there were steamboats, and then there were trains, and then there was the telegraph, and suddenly you could send a word instantaneously, or a message instantaneously from New York to, to St. Louis. And that was a phenomenal change that people were just not uh, accustomed to. There's a newspaper correspondent who described watching one of the first telegraph transmissions from Washington to Baltimore, and he says, this is a new species of consciousness. For the first time in human history, you can know with absolute certainty what is happening in a distant city over the horizon. Um, and what people then found out was the railroads and the telegraph and daily newspapers uh, brought people closer together, and they were more and more intensively confronted with their differences. Um, people in Massachusetts, which had banned slavery, or New York, which had mostly banned slavery, uh, various other states were very distant from this institution that they knew they disliked, but it was off over the horizon, and in a very real and human way, it moved closer to them and confronted them. Um, and the offenses of the other side moved closer to them. You've probably heard at least a word or two about the famous incident in which a Southern congressman came to uh, Northern Senator Charles Sumner on the floor of the uh, United States Senate in the Capitol. News of this spread instantaneously across the country. It spread to the anti-slavery North and the uh, pro-slavery South, and each newspapers on each side took the same information and did completely different stories about how outrageous the other side was instantly. And that kind of thing didn't happen. And there is a parallel to now, isn't there? Uh, if you think about the last decade, the last 15 years, um, I know some of you are freshmen here, so this is basically your entire lives have not changed that much. Thank you, by the way, for listening to NPR. Um, uh, but, but, but it's a phenomenal change from 15 years ago, the speed of information, the sheer amount of information, uh, relevant and irrelevant, and the constant demand to view things without perspective, to view things without distance. Whatever happens, I know I'm going on and on, but may I mention one thing? This is even a pre-social media thing. In 2005, uh, Hurricane Katrina struck the city of New Orleans. And of course it was devastating. I was in Washington, D.C., and I remember one afternoon I was off work at that point, and I was watching CNN, and they began showing a house on fire. They had an aerial a helicopter or something up there, and they had uh, shot down, there was a house on fire, and they just kept showing the flames, this house on fire, house on fire, house on fire, and it was so horrifying, and I thought, wow, like New Orleans, it's not gonna burn to the ground because it's flooded. 
but everything it looks like it's burning all the way down to the water line, like the entire city is destroyed from this close up of the house on fire. And a couple of days later, I was sent to New Orleans, and in fact, the city had not burned, a house had burned. Um, I mean, it was still a terrible situation, but that loss of perspective is what we're confronted with on a minute by minute, second by second basis if we're deep in any form of social media, or even if we're just watching television other than the PBS News Hour, um, <clears throat> which my, my, my daughter watched for the first time this spring, and she gets 20 minutes into it, and she's like, wow, this is interesting. Um, <clears throat> but it's not the way that most of us actually consume most of our news at this point. Yes, it's very true. Which is why the News Hour pushes all of our content out, streaming, um, uh, Instagram, TikTok, you name it. Great. Twitter, yeah, we have to be everywhere. YouTube, right. everything's on YouTube. Right. A couple of quick housekeeping things. One is when we do the question and answers, keep in mind that we are being recorded, and this is going to be on our YouTube page as well, the public editor's office. And uh, so, mind your mic. Take a clip. Edit it deceptively and get it out there. <laughs> so it is, it is. The, uh, the version that will be on our YouTube page will actually be edited by my daughter, a proud right. grad of the American University School of Communication 2020. But that brings me to a real critical point in all of this, the parallel. I would say that a couple of decades ago, it was Rush Limbaugh who began broadcasting um, first locally. I was in Sacramento and I remember hearing one of his early shows, stunned by what I was hearing, but then also compelled to listen more and more because this is the first time I'd heard these kinds of really extremist arguments being broadcast and then watching in another stunned fashion the growth of his show. And I'm looking back on this now and I'm thinking, is that where we began to see this chasm start to widen? And, and, um, and it, it, it begs the question, are we responsible as well as journalists uh, for creating the environment that we have now? Well, there's no question. The, the, the media, the news media has played a, an important central role in worsening, or I should say in, in deepening our polarization. For all the reasons Steve described about social media, um, cable, television, um, when along came, you know, in the beginning it was ABC, CBS, NBC, PBS, um, and commercial radio, and NPR came along, NewsHour eventually came along, and then in the 90s, along came CNN, and after a few, well, earlier than that, 1980, CNN, but in the mid, by the mid 90s, Fox came along, MSNBC, and at that point, Fox declared itself in the, from the from the get go that it was going to be the channel that spoke to conservatives who they, with Murdoch Earp argued, had not had a voice, had not had a place for their news to be reported, and from then on, there became this delineation on cable, and we've seen that wax and wane over the years, um, but whether it's cable, whether it is um, uh, uh, talk radio, and Rush Limbaugh is certainly the most prominent example of that, but there are now so many other examples online, and then of course when social media came along, and Steve has done such a good job of, of describing the effect of that, the media has played right into this. Um, how? Because conflict, <coughs> drama, uh, draws eyeballs on cable. It's much more interesting um, to to have two people yelling at each other or, or uh, denigrating each other on, on a set than it is to do an explanation of trade policy or here's what's really in the budget and you need to understand this in order to, to figure out what, you, where, what position you have. It's much more interesting if two people are sitting there arguing with each other and they've, they've turned that into a fine art and that's what we do. And so it's not the only thing that's driving our division. I mean, there are many other things going on in our society. Steve has touched on them. But it, you know, from the economy, trade policy, globalization, you know, the the, the widening uh, equity gap in our country, um, immigration. There's so many elements and layers I've found in traveling around the country. We've now done 40, 41 
pieces for the news hour over the last year and a half. We've been to 27 states. We've tried to, to shine a light on as many different kinds of this polarization as we could find and to look at efforts to bring people together. I mean, there are folks out there, there are organizations out there that are working really hard to try to bridge this divide to varying degrees of success. But to your point, the media has played right into it. We've made it worse. Some of it, some people point, and I'll just make this last point, to the disappearance of the Fairness Doctrine, which went away under President Reagan. Um, uh, as, as many of you have been around a long time as I have, will remember before that, there was a requirement that news organizations, the broadcast news at least, uh, present the other side. If you gave one politician uh, this amount of time, you needed to give the other side equal time. And, and you know, even without the Fairness Doctrine, our philosophy at News Hour is that we believe all sides deserve uh, time to make their argument, to make their case. We're not in this business to present one side or another. Um, but, but there are those who argue that, that that was kind of opening the floodgates and allowing, um, uh, if you will, a thousand flowers. Steve? Uh, yeah, I want to, uh, uh, this is not a counterpoint, but I want to think a little differently about our divisions and why uh, I believe they exist. Um, I would like to suggest that the fact that we feel divided and anxious about stuff may be good and a sign of progress in America. Um, in 1925, to pick a date, if you read the newspapers, the mainstream newspapers and so forth, there would be very little discussion of race in America. And if there was any, it would be almost entirely one single point of view. Because uh, anybody who had a problem with segregation in the American South or segregation in Northern cities or any number of other problems would be silenced or would be crushed or possibly even killed. That was normal in 1925. Um, and we now have a society in which a lot more people are free to speak, and free to speak with a reasonable amount of safety, uh, and who do speak very loudly. And so we sometimes feel bad about them shouting and raising real problems, or maybe we think they're imagined problems, but they're out there and they're, they're talking about it. Um, there is a part of society that is uncomfortable with the rate of change. Um, and there are things that have happened, not in your lifetime, but in my lifetime. Uh, when I was a kid, there was no such thing as gay marriage. There was no, uh, like, like I hadn't even heard the term, I didn't know the, the, the concept, and uh, if you were gay or lesbian, uh, you might live your life, you might live your life kind of in open, but you would just like never say the words, never be explicit about anything, and that was the, the best that that, that you could do. And then there was a profound change in society. And a lot of people were uncomfortable. A lot of people didn't like it. A lot of people had to be persuaded. And then at some point, really only about a decade ago, um, it became broadly okay for most of America to accept gay marriage and the Supreme Court accepted the constitutionality of same-sex marriages. And that is a very recent thing that took a lot of turmoil and affected a lot of elections and upset a lot of people and we know still upsets some people today. And we, we don't even really have to be angry if, if, if you, if I think there's somebody here who's upset in this room now and that's totally fine. Um, but it's, it's like we don't even have to be angry at it. It's, it's, it's hard for some people to change their, their views of things. Uh, and as soon as the Supreme Court seemed to settle same-sex marriage, it turned out there was this whole other set of issues having to do with trans people. And after that, there's gonna be something else. And this is hard. Um, but I think that most of us can agree that it is progress and that it is good uh, and that it's heading to a better place when we confront things that make us uncomfortable. That's a good point. Thank you for that. And it actually leads to this critical question. Can we walk back from the chasm? Or walk back and then figure out how to build a bridge? Is it possible? Do we even want to? Um, it, it seems to me that, that the media these days 
is becoming increasingly comfortable taking sides. Um, and, and taking advantage of it. And, yeah, that's a good point. Taking advantage of the, of the chasm. So I'm wondering, is it possible to, to bring it back and have those kinds of discussions that were uh, run by Robert's rules, right? And still as a Mexican immigrant, I'm still trying to figure out who this Robert's guy is. <laughs> <laughs> and how he got so much power. Um, but I'm wondering, uh, can we get there? Or do we get there? And how do we do it? I don't know how to approach that other than one day at a time. Uh, the thing that I have any influence over is a daily radio program and a daily podcast, um, which are heard, each of them, by millions of people. And I can try to get a lot of ideas and perspectives and some sense of the day's news to people uh, in conjunction with my, my, my colleagues and get my fellow citizens information humbly recognizing that I'm not gonna have all the truth today. Also advising you that if anybody tells you that they have the entire truth, they're lying to you, you're not to trust them. But humbly recognizing I won't get it all today, and I'm gonna keep working on it tomorrow. It's a day by day thing. Right, and I think an example is in one of your segments is a conversation with the Reverend Greg Block in, in Tennessee, who was, you know, revived his church by going the hard line on issues. But then in your conversation, he says, I wish we could get back to a, a, pl a place of agreement. Yet he still lives in that world where he takes a hard line stance on many issues. He, he's an example of a minister in uh, rural Tennessee near Nashville who um, had an evangelical congregation, came out of the Baptist tradition, but was an evangelical, and found, um, uh, uh, shall we say, common ground with, uh, with Donald Trump, went all in for Donald Trump and made the political argument part of his, his message, his message of faith in the church, dating back to 2016, and then in 2020, he showed up at the Capitol on January the 6th, 2021. Um, in the aftermath of that, he didn't go into the Capitol, but he was in the crowd outside. In the aftermath of that, there was a lot of pushback um, in the community where he lives, he found enough pushback that he decided it wasn't where he wanted to be. He still is very much pro-Trump, and that and that and all the Trump message, the entire Trump message, finds its way into his sermons. But he is not as overtly pushing for uh, one side or another in the election. Um, and I and you're right. He did say, "I wish we could come together." Um, you know, in that interview. Um, and, I, and, I, and I've told him I want to stay in touch with him to see, you know, to see what happens. To see if he actually does. Another thing that happened in Tennessee, though, that I want, to, I want to bring up, I wish, Steve, what you said, I mean, I hope that is true. I mean, I want to believe that this, we're in a healthier place because we can have these debates now about race, about uh, uh, gender, <coughs> about uh, our, our sexual identity, about all these tough, tough questions. But, for example, we went to Tennessee for another story in the aftermath of a shooting at a Christian school there, the Covenant shooting in the summer of 2022. Six children were killed, nine children, I think, and six children and three adults were killed at a school by uh, a young person. And a group of people uh, came together in Tennessee across the political spectrum, far left and far right, to try to come up with a very modest proposal for ways to reduce gun violence in the aftermath of this. They presented it, and it was all work put together by this group called Starts With Us. It was one of these bridging organizations. Sure. So they presented, they came up with these ideas, they presented it to the state legislature. And they, and by the way, this group included very pro-Second Amendment folks, including a gentleman we interviewed at length who owns a shooting range. And they presented it to the state legislature. They were not even given a hearing. The Republican members who the state legislature who happened to be in the majority would not even allow, didn't even attend the, would, would not attend the briefing that they organized. And the Second Amendment uh, followers on that in that group were more than discouraged by this. I interviewed him after this happened, one particular, in fact, two of them afterwards. And he said, I worry that I am being, you know, that I won't even be able to keep my business, my shooting range because I've now been identified in the community 
as working with the other side. Yeah. Um, it was a discouraging final chapter to that story. I want to think that there's yet another chapter. I heard NPR had a story yesterday morning, I want to say, Steve, or the day before, uh, three or four of the mothers who were, whose children were in that classroom have also, and these were mothers who were done right to yeah. went to the state legislature, yeah. I guess in the same scenario maybe later, they were also turned away. Uh -huh. So maybe there's another chapter. Maybe there's another chapter. I think you hit at part of the dynamic, and you alluded to it earlier when you talked about people being taught that the other side are evil, that you can't deal with them. Um, if someone can come to you with a perfectly reasonable proposal that you would agree to if someone else brought it, but, but like you're a Republican and a Democrat proposed it, so it must be evil, it must be wrong. Things become wrong because the other side is okay with it. Um, that dynamic has even infected Congress. I mean, that's what's happened to a number of these bipartisan deals. They fall apart as soon as one side's political supporters and their partisan media and so forth get wind of a compromise. Like, the bill must be bad because the other guys are willing to, to go for it. Um, and there has been a really unhealthy dynamic there. Right. And I think this can take us now to um, questions from the audience. So the current staffers who are going to be running the mic, put on your track shoes, please. And we're going to go to, the first question is going to come from Julie. But I'm going to remind Julie that when you're ready to do the six over 60, I'm ready for my interview. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just so you know, that's not an original idea. People have asked us to do the 50 over 50 and the 40 over 40. <laughs> What's lost here is the value of listening, which is something that Dave, I say, StoryCorps has been promoting. And even from like an intellectual perspective, uh, the value of hearing and listening to other ideas and other views that helps you clarify your own position or maybe even challenges your own position. And the listening enables us to continue to humanize or start to humanize instead of otherize people. So what I want to ask you about is university because uh, this is a volatile environment, especially now. There's supposed to be places of dialogue and education and learning and you know, intellectual stimulation. Are you concerned about younger Americans not only being disinfect disaffected, disengaged, cynical about politics, not voting, but also choosing to not be exposed to views that differ from their own if they actually have a point of view that's first. Well, in fact, one of the stories we did <coughs> in America at a crossroads was uh, involved going to several colleges, including American University, and to interview some of your faculty. There's a, there's a class, uh, it was an after class program called Disagree with a Professor. And it was about make, helping students become more comfortable with speaking up in class, even if they felt their ideas were very much in the minority or just you know, something that nobody else would think, uh, but to give them the courage and the, and the, the language to use to, to, dis to disagree with the professor or, or to speak up against others in the class. And we use that as, an, as a very uh, effective example that, that other schools, I've since heard other schools <coughs> to do similar things. Um, I'm not ready to write off the younger generation. I like to let them speak for themselves because I find that every time I assume that they do things a certain way or hear things a certain way, that they end up surprising me because they know more, they know a whole lot more than I think they're often given credit for. And they follow, yes, they're following the news differently from the way we did. They're not, maybe not getting up in the morning and reading the newspaper by turning pages or uh, watching the entire 60 Minutes of the PBS News Hour, but they may be catching a clip of uh, an interview that Steve did on uh, Morning Edition, or maybe they're watching a piece that Amna Nawaz or Jeff Bennett or one of our other amazing correspondents, Lisa Desjardins or Laura, Laura Lopez or one of our other correspondents from the News Hour did that will show up on YouTube or some other uh, uh, social media venue. So I, and, and I will say in my travels around the country, when I've ever had the opportunity to talk to young people, they are much more engaged and, and up on what's going on. And 
frankly, more willing, and, and, and let me put it this way, and more prepared to say, I don't like this division. I want us to be able to talk to the other side. So that's my very unscientific uh, uh, sampling of opinion out there. Yeah, I'm happy to hear that. I think that in any environment, and I'm sure a university is, is uh, the same, you hear from the strongest or most uh, extreme voices, and maybe there's a great bulk of students who are interested in hearing different viewpoints and from different kinds of people uh, and who are not out there like going to shut down a speaker who's invited, who's you know off base or, or, or whatever it is. Uh, I would hope that people are willing to expose themselves to uncomfortable conversations um, and that people would uh, pick up some skills for how to do that, how to make it not personal, um, how to listen to the other person and find ways to engage and respond. Um, I have some practice with this with my own family. I'm from Indiana. Uh, my mom is still there. Uh, my mom is a Fox News watcher. Um, and occasionally, I don't mean to shock you, uh, she hears something different on Fox News than what she gets from NPR. And she will ask me about the difference. And I will try to, I mean, it's a discussion with my mom. I'm not gonna yell at my mom, you're wrong! Um, but often I'll, I'll begin by saying, actually, okay, they're, they're, what they told you, these three things they told you are, are, are correct. Um, these other three, the three things I think are irrelevant, and here's an additional fact that I learned about this from my own, own reporting, um, and I'm not trying to change my mom's mind about anything because I'm not going to change my mom's mind about anything. Thing, but she also listens to other sources of information, including her son. Um, and so you just, you continue the, the, the conversation um, and you try to recognize the other person as a person, um, which is a little easier if it is your relative, a little harder if it is a stranger, but that stranger comes from a particular background, has a particular perspective, might say all the things the wrong way, doesn't know how to use the right language, or is just totally wrong about something. Um, but you can still engage them. It doesn't kill you to hear what they have to say, and maybe you can push back in some civil way, and maybe you can do a little bit of good over time. Ricardo, may I just do a quick shout out to somebody in the audience, uh, two people in the audience who represent the kind of journalism that we should all celebrate. John Sawyer and Ken Sawyer are back there, near the back of the room. Pulitzer Center for the Crisis Reporting. They do some of the most amazing reporting. The News Hour has been very blessed and fortunate to partner with the Pulitzer Center on so many stories. They, they go places around the world and report on stories that nobody else is reporting. The reporters they work with have the kind of courage that I want to shout, call out, shout out, and I just uh, can't celebrate the work that they do anymore. Thank you, John. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Thank you.